good evening, Cross Life. And let us continue the worship of our God through the preaching of his word. And if you will, please stand with me as we honor the reading of God's word. We'll be reading Ephesians 5, 22 through 23. Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle, or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, let each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. Let's pray. Father, we praise you for your love is magnificent. It is beyond our comprehension that even though we sin, though we deserve hell, though we have rebelled against you, you have loved us with perfect sacrificial love. And you brought us to saving faith that we may know that we can enjoy that love for eternity. And that love to us in the gospel may it shape our lives May it get down into our hearts and shape every aspect and shape our marriages so that we reflect your gospel to the glory of our Lord. Pray this in your son's name. Amen. You may be seated. So this passage in Ephesians, it reveals a great mystery to us, that marriage is designed to reflect the gospel. And this necessarily brings out the importance, the centrality of the gospel to marriage. The gospel that we believe, the gospel that has saved us, the gospel that tells us of the good news that God has redeemed a sinful, wicked people, people that were rebellious. And he did that by sacrificing Jesus Christ in our spot, that he might reconcile people to himself. And he not only died on the cross, but he resurrected to new life, validating the claims. That is where we know what we believe is true. We know our hope is solid. And he's redeemed us to be a people who get to honor him and serve him with our lives due to his radical love. And that is the gospel that should transform us. It saved us, but it not only saved us, it continues to save us. It transforms our life every day of our Christian walk. And in particular, this gospel should affect our marriage. So we just stated that the, the gospel was beautifully designed by God. He was artfully designed for as he intentionally put each role to reflect the gospel, different aspects of it, different facets he was very intentional giving husbands the, the role of leadership. And so the wife, the role of submission. And so as these couples fulfill their roles, they tangibly reflect the gospel. The husband, when he's leading, he's displaying Christ-like servant leadership. And the woman, as she submits, she displays this church's submission and showcases the worthiness of Christ as she's showing that her life is worth submitting to something, that she has something greater. And so each of these depict the wisdom of God as they display his glory, as we and our marriages are designed for this purpose, designed to show the glories of the gospel and ultimately the matchless glory of Christ. And so such is the honor of those of you who are married today. You have the supreme privilege and the divine responsibility of faithfully displaying, displaying the gospels in your marriage. And so when he's teaching us this, that our, gospels, uh, that, that our marriages are meant to display the gospel, he's teaching us something profound, that marriage is ultimately about something much bigger than ourselves. Friends, marriage is not about you. It never was, never is, and never will be about you, but it will always be about God. And God has so chosen that the precious and beautiful gospel would be displayed in our marriages. And since he's designed marriage for this purpose, it must be reflected and changed the way we live our marriages. It should look different than the world. 
And this is what undergirded the teachings of the last two weeks when we were in Peter. It's because of the worthiness of Christ is displayed in the gospel that women will willingly submit to their husbands. It is because of the gospel love of Christ that men who are naturally blunt and naturally harsh will seek to know and honor their wives in an an understanding way, and in tender gentleness. We do these out-of-this-world things because we are committed to glorifying God by displaying his out-of-this-world gospel. And the implications are extensive. Honestly, I, I do kind of want to do a whole marriage series, but we're not, it's not going to be the, the focus. I'm, I actually, though, might make a class for Cross Life, a marriage focus. I think it would be a really cool resource to rejuvenate, strengthen, teach the marriages at Cross Life. Um, so stay tuned for that, coming to Cross Life near you at some point. But for now, as we've been going the flow of expositing Peter, two weeks ago, we exposited what he said to the wife. Last week, we studied what he said to the husband. And this week, what I want to do is I simply just want to step out from Peter and shade in those roles a little bit more, fill it in. And so what we're going to be doing today is we're going to be going back and forth between husband. There's going to be a lot of talking to the husband and then a quick interjection to the wife and talking to the wife and quick interjection to the husband. And that makes sense because these roles are very intertwined. But the way we're going to break this down is here's the focus, the thesis, that the primacy of the displaying the gospel should affect your marriage in three ways. That's what we're going to be looking at today, that the primacy of displaying the gospel should affect your marriage in three ways. It should shape the goal for your spouse. It should form the way you fulfill your role and should cause you to depend on Christ. I'll repeat those for note-takers. It should shape your goal for your spouse. It should form the way you fulfill your role, and it should cause you to depend on Christ. So let's start with the first, how the primacy of displaying the gospel should shape your goal for your spouse. Husbands, what is it that you most desire to see in your wife? What is it you most truly want for her above anything else? Wives, I ask you the same back. What is it you most desire for your husband? What is it that you truly want for him most? And so both of you, I'm asking, what is your biggest goal and desire for your spouse? And so let's talk to each what it should be, what it ought to be. Let's start with the husbands in Ephesians 5. Again, read with me Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So this teaches us that Christ loved the church and he gave himself up for her. Why? That he might sanctify her. Christ focuses the holiness of his bride, that she might be set apart, pure, clean, clean and spotless, that she will be brilliant in splendor, like a clean and spotless lamp, crystal clear, that doesn't have any dirt or spot on it that blocks the rays from getting out, but it's clean so that they shine uninhibited. uninhibited. And that's Christ's desire for us as the church and as the husband, you reflecting Christ. That must be your greatest desire for your wife, her holiness, the holiness and purity of your wife. What a role. What a privilege that you've been gifted a wife under your stewardship that you might seek her holiness and lift her up and present her before the Lord as holy and spotless. And so how? How are we to go about doing that? What is the tool that Christ used? It tells us that Christ cleansed her by the washing of the water of the word. His word, that is how God cleanses us. It's how he sanctifies us and purifies us. It's through cleansing water. That's the spot remover. It's his purifying agent. And this is the instrument of sanctification in the hands of Christ. So too must it be in the hands of the husband. Husbands, if your primary desire is your wife's holiness, then you must wash her in the word. And so what does this look like? It looks like letting the gospel continually flow out in action and in word towards your wife. Particularly, letting your words be saturated with the word. Your speech always full of the grace of life with the salt of the word. This looks like encouraging her when she's discouraged with promises from the word. It looks like exhorting her where there's areas of growth with the commands of scripture. But not just looking at areas where she needs to grow. It's also commending her, telling her she does great and and giving her the words of truth from the Bible, praising her with God's words. 
It's discussing what you're learning in Scripture in your own personal devotions, and it's taking the lead to study the Bible together. Husbands, let your life be like a gently flowing river, and let her be like a stone who rests constantly in the streams of your loving care, so that over time, as the Word continues to flow out from your life, that it washes over her, and it continues, and it makes her beautiful, smooth, without any sharp edges, without any dirt or blemishes, but making her beautiful and holy and pure. This must define your primary ministry to your wife. And without this, you're, without the lifelong ministry of washing your wife in the word, you have failed your divine calling as a husband. You will have been found wanting in the most important ministry of your life. And gentlemen, this is your primary duty as a husband before God. This is not negotiable. This is not a side thing that you can be a faithful husband before God and fail to wash your, your wife in the word. You must do it. But to properly do this, to properly be able to fulfill this, the prereq is that you must be grounded in the word yourself. You must be a lover of God's word. You must be someone that is daily communing with the Lord, who meditates on it day and night, constantly growing in the knowledge of our God through his word. For how can you, husband, try to wash your word if you don't know how to use it yourself? And furthermore, how convincing is your testimony to her? If you tell her that it's so important for her, that she needs it every day, if you fail to partake in it yourself. It's kind of like if you hear about someone tell you about their amazing new program, it's a fitness program and it's going to transform your physique. It's going to give you life and energy. But the guy who's telling you about this is a lazy, fat, sluggish couch potato. How convinced will you be? You won't. And likewise, your wives see how you live at home. They see if you find the word as really that important in your life, if you really feast upon it daily. And so if you tell her she needs it she'll, and you don't partake in it, do you think she's really going to be convinced that when you tell her she needs it daily, that without it she can do nothing? She won't. She'll likely resist you when you try to prescribe it for yourself when you won't take a bath yourself. Now, as an aside on that point, if she's going to have a resistant heart, I do want to reach out to you wives that if your husband is trying to wash you in the word and trying to exhort you in it, he may discredit his own testimony, his own words, but I exhort you to humbly still receive the word. Because even if the husband's testimony is disqualified, Christ is not. You need the word. He tells you that you need to be washed in it, and that you can do nothing unless you abide in it. His word is still essential for you. So don't resist. So if your husband is an unworthy washer, but he is still washing, don't resist. Don't make it like him trying to wash a kitten. Don't fight him. Don't scratch back. Don't make this a miserable experience for both of you. Fighting back in word and action, resisting when he's talking to you. Don't be the wife that will listen to anyone else when they hear the word but their husband. Because God has given you a husband for this special purpose. So humbly receive it with him, from him and do it with joy. And husband, knowing that you're washing a kitten, when you wash her with the word, do it with gentleness and love. May she be, she be so convinced that even though she doesn't like the water, that you're doing it out of love. Let all of your actions before, all your actions after, and even as you're administering the word to her heart, May it be couched in love, in gentleness. May she be convinced that you are working solely for her good and solely for the glory of Christ. This is why last week when we talked about living in an understanding way and honoring her and living in gentleness is so important so that she is receptive to hear the word. But that was just an aside. I'm stepping back to that main point that husbands, your main duty is to wash your wives in the word. There's no way around this. And husbands... Hear me clearly. If you lose your communion with God, you will not only lose the source of strength by which you will fulfill your role as a husband, but you will lose the very thing you most want to impart to your bride. 
Therefore, prioritize your communion with God. May you be characterized by abiding in him, that you may be able to walk in accordance with the gospel design and so wash your wife as you lovingly lead her. So I exhort you, husbands, if you're already doing this, praise the Lord. See if there is areas you can wash her more. But if you're not washing her in the word, I exhort you to pursue the Lord yourself. Be a lover of the word. Be regularly in the word, dedicated to knowing his word every day. And then as quick as possible, begin the lifelong career of washing your bride in the word. And so husbands, this is what we ought to desire in our wives. But wives, what should you ought to desire most in your husbands? Turn with me to 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3, 1 through 2. She said, Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see your respectful and pure conduct. And so we see here that his point is still, if they don't obey the word, that that is her focus. Her focus is, her desire is her husband's conformity to the word, his holiness, his obedience to the gospel. And though the way that you're instructed to go about doing this is different, the desire for his conformity to the word must be your biggest prayer. For Christ's sake, for his sake, and for your own sake. So rather than nagging him, you have to seek to win him over in action. You pray for him as you live a pure and holy life, as you walk in submission to him, as we learned two weeks ago. But wives, what is true for you, and for husbands, is also true for you. You must be a lover of the word, constantly abiding in his presence. To be able to live that holy, chaste life that serves as a witness to him, you have to be a lover of the word, and it has to be independent, independent of your husband. Even if he fails to wash you, you are to find your strength in God. I mean, recall what we learned in Peter. He was talking to unsaved wives, or unsaved husbands, wives to unsaved husbands. And he says, even if your husbands don't obey the words, there's still requirements for the wife. Strive to win him over. Have that imperishable quality of beautiful and gentle spirit. Have a hope in God that leads you to submit in confidence. And so what we see there is that the wife, she's seen having spiritual strength despite her husband. And so it must be with you. If your greatest desire is to win him over to the Lord, if your marriage is to glorify God, you must be firmly grounded in the word. You need to find your hope and your strength in God. You need to be a lover of the Lord who regularly abides in the word. Wives, hear me clearly. If you lose your communion with God, you will not only lose the source of strength by which you will fulfill your duties as a wife, but you will lose the very thing you most want to impart to your husband. Therefore, prioritize your communion with God. May you be characterized by abiding in him so that you may be able to find the strength to walk in accordance with God's design and so joyfully submit to your husband. Now, husband, I think we made this clear, but just in case we didn't, let me reemphasize it, that all because she has to have a walk independent of you does not justify your disobedience because this is part of being the leader. It's part of the blessing, but also the, the heavy responsibility of being a leader is that leadership comes with more responsibility. When there's a problem in your marriage, you have the primary responsibility unto which God will address. I think Piper puts this well in a quote, if we could get it up on the screen. There we go. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden and God came to call them to account, it didn't matter that Eve had sinned first. God said, Adam, where are you? That's God's word to the family today. Adam, husband, father, where are you? If something is not working right at your house and Jesus comes knocking on the door, he may have an issue with your wife. But the first thing he's going to say when she opens the door is, is the man of the house home? Yes, she is responsible for her walk with the Lord. But ultimately, husbands, the buck stops with you. And you're going to have to give an account for your obedience to the Lord. 
So let us husbands not be those as described as disobedient to the word. Let that not define us. But may we be those who wash our wives in the word. For this is our greatest privilege, and it is a duty for which we will give account to the Lord. And so both husband's wife, my appeal to you is very simple, straightforward, but essential. Because marriage is not about you. It's about God's glory being revealed through the gospel. This must shape your desire for your spouse. Namely, your spouse's sanctification, her purity, his purity must, his Christ-likeness, her Christ-likeness must be your greatest desire. And this desire, the pursuit of this desire starts with your own thriving relationship with the Lord. This is where God-glorifying marriage starts. Two people firmly abiding in the word, firmly grounded. Therefore, pursue Christ daily so you can faithfully fulfill your duty to spur one another on towards Christ. Now, I have been talking to married couples, and I will the rest of the time, but I want to make this, this one aside to the non-married. And that is that this same appeal I'm making so strongly for the husband and the wife, I make to you. Because so many times, the biggest lie that we fall for before marriage is that I will be different after I get married. That's when things will start. That's when I'll become a leader. That's when I'll learn to have a submissive heart. That's when I'll start pursuing God. But that's not true. The same person that you are before marriage is the same person you will be in marriage. And so my appeal to you is that if you're pursuing marriage, even if you're not pursuing marriage, our goal is to glorify God in our life, to have the gospel displayed, and that starts by abiding in his word. We cannot forsake that. So start there. Now, let's move on to the second piece, that the second way that the, the goal of displaying the gospel should affect our marriages. And namely, it should affect the way we fulfill our roles. It should shape the way that the husband leads and it should shape the way that the wife submits. And so that's where I was saying I wanted to just fill those in a little bit more, add a little bit more color. There's a lot more we could say, but I wanted to talk about them a little bit more than we did the last two weeks. And so headship and submission, they're actually beautiful concepts if they're shaped as God intended them. But sin is what distorted them and makes them repulsive. Let me read another quote for you that beautifully expands this idea. It says, when sin entered the world... It ruined the harmony of marriage, not because it brought headship and submission into existence, but because it twisted man's humble, loving headship towards hostile domination in some men and lazy indifference in others. And it twisted woman's intelligent, willing, happy, creative, articulate submission towards manipulative obsequiousness. I had to look that up. It's servility, like being a servant. In some women and brazen insubordination in others. Sin didn't create headship and submission. It ruined them and it distorted them, making them ugly and destructive. And so I wanted to look at these which are naturally beautiful when they're shaped by the gospel. And so I want to look at each role a little bit more. So beginning with you husbands, our role, we have this special privilege and the divine calling to lead our wives as Christ led the church. And there's a key element I want to bring out that should shape our leadership, and that's going to be in Ephesians 5:25. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And so the key here is sacrificial love. Leadership must be shaped by sacrificial, serving love of Christ. And this refutes the idea of the world's picture of authority. Those in the world, they lord their power over others. And that's why when we hear the idea of husband as head or leader, that we snarl at the idea with distaste. Because we fill this command with the ideas we've seen implemented in the world, the world. But rather, we need to look at how Scripture defines leadership. And how Scripture defines authority. It teaches us that true headship is shaped by sacrificial love. And this truth should shape that leadership. It should shape what husband's leadership is not and what it is. And so that's how we're going to look at this. What husband's leadership is not. It is not self-centered domination. And it's not passive disinterest. So it is not either of those, but it is Christ-centered, passionate love that works for the good of your wife. So first, what it's not. It is not self-centered. Husband's true biblical leadership is not focused on the self. Do you know why God has given us a wife as a helper? Why we have a helper? 
He has not given us a helper that we can fill all of our desires and all of our preferences. But he's given us a helper that we might better glorify God. Remember, marriage is not about you, but about Christ. And Christ, having authority over his followers, he did not abuse them. He didn't have them fulfill all his pleasures, but he sacrificed his own self, his desires to serve them. And we see that model for us so clearly in Philippians 2. Turn there with me. Philippians 2, 3 through 8. Philippians 2, 3 through 8. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. But he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross." And so Christ, having the authority of God himself, he didn't use this power to force us, his will on us, but he sacrificed himself. He considered our interests above his own, our good, even to the point of death on a cross. And God did not give you, he did not give us husbands a helper that we might have more of our desires fulfilled, but more that we can serve and lift up, that we might be a team that we might complement one another, that they, our helper may complement our weaknesses and we can strive as a unit for the glory of God. And so our love is not to be self-focused and nor is it to be domination. God didn't give you more power, more authority, more strength that you might squash her into compliance with your desires. It is interesting how many husbands know they're the head and they know that the women are supposed to submit, but they forget the part where they are supposed to be like Christ who died for his bride. And so when two preferences collide, this is where most often that the husband's going to say that the wife needs to submit. And he's flabbergasted when she doesn't. But husbands, when two preferences collide, this is where we get to lead. We don't demand submission, but we get to lead by giving giving up, taking up initiative and giving up our preferences, dying to ourselves for her pleasures and her good. We get to sacrifice ourselves that she may have more joy. And so we don't force ourselves on her, but we woo her with our love and make it her joy to submit. But this is how Christ acted with us. He secured our loyal submission, not making us comply with force. He didn't assert his power to make us subservient, but he wooed us through his sacrificial love, and so now it is our joy to give him all of our lives. And likewise, husbands, don't dominate her, but woo her. Strive after her good, her Christ-likeness. Love her and give up yourself, using your strength and your authority to serve her. Die to yourself that she might live, and in doing so, what you'll most likely find is that it's her pleasure to submit to you. And so biblical leadership, what it's not, it is not self-centered domination, but it is Christ-centered and subsequently other-centered, your wife-centered, wooing love. And so it's not this, but it's also not passive indifference. That's the other side of the spectrum where it gets distorted. The role of leadership gets distorted. Passive indifference, the eh, whatever attitude. This is not biblical leadership. It's not knowing things need to change and take place that you need to pursue godliness, but just hoping that your wife's going to do it. No, men, this is our role as leaders. We get to take passionate initiative, passionate pursuit of our God, and passionate pursuit of our wives, and passionate pursuit of our marriage, that God might be glorified. We are the ones who lead. We get to take charge and responsibility. And what this looks like is it looks like setting a vision towards Christ-likeness for your life, for your wife's life, and for your families. We are the ones who get to start that conversation of how we can best glorify God in all the different areas of our life. We get to take initiative in pursuing our bride. We get to initiate 
how, the conversations of how are we going to pursue unity together. We get to talk about and start the conversation of how us as the husbands can love her better, asking her input. We get to proactively seek ways to love her. More than expected. More than just anniversaries and birthdays and holidays. Husbands, we get to find other days of the year to make our wife feel special and shower our love on her. And men, this is what we ought to do. We ought to be those who take initiative. We're not passive. But a word to wives, just a quick word. The fastest way to get a passive man who's not interested in leading your marriage is to squash him when he attempts to lead. What I mean by squash him is to criticize him, make biting remarks, be unenthused, unimpressed, uninterested in his efforts. And so my appeal to you is don't do this. You want a husband who's going to lead and take initiative towards Christ. So don't squash him. He's going to fumble. He's going to make wrong calls. That's how we grow in being leaders. But your special role as the helper is to lift him up and encourage him, even when his leadership is inadequate. So instead of squashing him, have an attitude that affirms his role as leader and seeks to support him when he's trying to lead. And husbands, as you lead, don't forget she's your helper. She's your specially designed bride who's a helper suitable for your weaknesses. God specially designed her for that. And so this flows back to that domination idea that we hit. Not only must you not dominate her for your own preferences, but even when we're trying to pursue godly things, don't dominate her. Don't just simply dictate to her how things are going to be done. And this is really a big concept that I see in a lot of marriages of men who are actually trying to lead well. They're trying to take the right steps of leadership. And so here's the concept I want to bring forth. The husbands, we have primary leadership not soul leadership. We have primary responsibility, but we do not need to do it alone. We actually, we should not do it alone. That's actually the point of having a helper. Instead, inform your leadership with her opinion and wisdom. God granted you a wife with unique perspective, with wisdom and beauty, but he didn't make her, her your helper so you could just decide everything on your own apart from her and tell her how it's going to be. God made you a team for his glory. And so what am I saying? That when you are stepping up to take initiative, that's wonderful. You're doing what you ought to do to lead your wife towards Christ. But when you're going to make decisions, involve her. Let her inform your leadership. So for example, if you want to start having family devotions, that's wonderful. Tell her your idea. Bring it to her and start as leading, taking initiative. Tell her, hey, this is what I would love to do to lead our family towards Christ. These are the books I, want, I think we should study. But then ask her, does she think that's the best book for your family? Does she see any others that could be more beneficial? What ideas does she have that you can incorporate and make this a better home Bible study? But for all areas in life where you're leading, whether it's financial decisions, you want to move out of town, you want to implement something new in your parenting, Tell her your ideas. Ask her what she thinks. Is she convinced that this is the best for the kingdom? What does she think? God has made you a team for displaying his glory. So work in tandem towards this goal and do it by letting your leadership be informed by her insight. And so that's, that's a bigger, fuller package of biblical leadership that is, that is shaped by sacrificial love. It causes the man to be predominantly concerned with Christ's needs and his wife's needs, and he puts that over his own. It causes him not to lead her with force, but to love her by wooing her. And it's not passive. It is a passionate pursuit that pursues Christ in her, and it takes into account her beautifully gifted wisdom and her perspective, and it helps him form how he leads the family. And so with that, if you take that and you add in the concepts that we, we studied last week. That'll give you a much fuller picture of biblical, gospel-shaped leadership of a husband. And now, wives, it's your turn. The predominance of the goal of displaying the gospel should also impact submission, what it does not look like and what it looks like. So read with me Ephesians 5, 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. 
So ladies, your reverence for your husbands, it's an outflow of your reverence for Christ. In the same manner that Christ submits to the, or the church submits to Christ, so you submit to the husband. And so wife, you actually you have a very special role of displaying the worthiness of Christ in your submission to your husband. For when we submit our lives to Jesus, we show the world that we have something more valuable than even our own autonomy. It greatly displays how worthy, how valuable our Christ is. And so when you submit to your husband, this pictures the way the church submits to Christ. And so this truth of Christ's sacrificial love and dying for us should shape the way that you submit to your husband. And so it shapes first what it's not. It is not self-centered disrespect, and it is not passive disinterest. But it is Christ-centered, passionate, joyful respect that works for his good. So first, for the wife, the not self-centered. Just as the husband's leadership is not to be self-centered, neither is your focus to be on yourself. For submission is supposed to be an outflow of following and focusing on Christ. In 1 Peter 3, we saw that submission is out of fear of God. It's concerned most about what he thinks. And in the marriage context, what he thinks is, what he wants is submission in all things. Ephesians 5.24 says, Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Obviously, and just to clarify, because someone asked me after one of the last times, this doesn't refer to sin. If your husband ever instructs you to sin, you have to deny that request. But even still, I'm appealing with you to communicate a heart of submission. And what that looks like is a heart that's broken and expresses to him, I want to submit, but I can't do that because I must submit to God above you. So it's not just a, a hand stiff, I'm going to serve God but it's showing him that I actually want you to lead and lead me in godliness so I can submit because that's where I'll thrive. But sin aside, you're to submit in everything. And so this means is when he disregards your preferences, even if he's selfish, hopefully we've addressed that. Hopefully that's not his heart. But even if it is, this is where you submit to him. You conduct yourself in a quiet and gentle way, considering others is more important than yourself. What we read for the husband, Philippians 2, also applies to you, to consider his interests above you. And so when he disregards you, your focus isn't to be on yourself, but on Christ, on honoring Christ and loving and respecting your husband. And so when he doesn't pay attention to your desires, you don't stomp your feet to get your way, and you're not manipulating him with a cold shoulder. And so it is not self-centered, and it is not disrespect. That's the second piece, is it's not disrespectful. And you can submit externally, but true submission is internal. You can submit and do what he says outwardly, but inwardly you're mad or you're grumbling, or what I've seen a lot is a growing bitterness over time. But this is not the type of submission fitting in the Lord. Recall from Peter's discussion on submission in 1 Peter 3. He says, 1 Peter 3, 4, it says, But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit. That quiet spirit, we talked about how that's a peaceful tranquility found in God, like that peaceful lake in the morning. And this stems from hoping in God, knowing that he's going to take care of you, trusting that God will be your defender. Trusting that God knows the husband he gave you. Trusting that God knows and sees how your husband is treating you and disregarding you. And trusting that God will bring all things and expose them before the judgment throne on the final day. And also trusting that he will reward submission. And so you submit with joy and you do it with respect. Ephesians 5.33 says, However, let each one of you love his wife as himself and let his wife see that she respects her husband. And so respect for your husband, it flows inwardly to external actions. God cares about both. And so regardless of the worthiness of your husband, you joyfully and respectfully submit to his leadership. You honor him in your heart. Like when we, we read in Peter about Sarah who called Abraham Lord in her inner mumblings so may you honor him in your heart because you honor Christ as Lord. Regardless of if your husband can hear it or not, you truly honor and respect him. 
And so when he, he disregards you, you die to yourself. That God might be honored. You seek your husband's interest and his godliness above all. And you do this again because it's ultimately not about you. It's not about him, but it's about Christ. And both of you for displaying his glory as a team. So it's not self-centered disrespect. And just like the husband, it's also not passive. It's not a, eh, this is the husband's deal. He's responsible for this marriage. He's the leader. It's not that type of submission. When you got married, you don't leave your brain and your skills and your abilities at the altar. You don't just passively flutter wherever the wind blows. The wind blows. It's not as if all of the responsibility falls on your husband. And so that's me pulling in that same concept back to you, wives. He has primary responsibility, but not sole responsibility because you're his helper to help him glorify God. Wives, God has incredibly and wonderfully designed you. He's given you a unique blend of wisdom and creativity and skills and beauty. And he gave you those gifts so that you can honor and affirm your husband's leadership to seek the glory of God. So don't just passively sit back and just have him do everything. No, you apply yourself to the glory of God using your skills and your wisdom. And so when you see your husband taking initiative, you see him stepping up to take the lead, be involved, be engaged. If he's making decisions, and he's setting goals, and he wants to incorporate you in that. Take notice of it. Express it out loud. Have an attitude that welcomes his leadership and says that you're thankful for him taking initiative. But I'm actually speaking really. Actually thank him with your words for obeying God's command and seeking to lead you. And then get involved. Make, when he was making decisions about family devotions and he asks you your opinion, get involved. Strategize. Set aside time. See how you can prioritize what he's trying to, trying to make for your family. Get along with him. Try and see and think and brainstorm what are the best decisions for God's kingdom. Be involved. But in all of this, have a heart that even if he lands on a decision opposite of what you've said, that your heart willingly yields, that you entrust yourself to your husband's leadership and ultimately to God who sees your submission and will bless it. And so wives, this is submission. It's not self-centered disrespect that harbors bitterness towards your husband and fights for your own wants and desires. It's not passive apathy towards your marriage and the things of God. But biblical submission is shaped by experiencing the sacrificial love of Christ, and it causes the wife to be so concerned with Christ's needs and your husband's needs and places them over her own. It causes her to joyfully Respect and yield her will to her husband's leadership. And it's not passive, but it's a passionate pursuit of Christ and her husband, applying her beautifully gifted wisdom and talents towards good works for the glory of God. And so that's how the gospel should be affecting the way our marriage looks, how men lead and how wives submit. And our marriages should look radically different than those in the world. And now I want to just quickly turn to the, the third piece of how the premise of displaying the gospel should affect our marriages. And namely, it should cause us to be dependent on Christ. Because here's the thing. The things that I laid out are astounding. We establish that marriage is supposed to reflect the gospel, that because our marriages are so much bigger than ourselves, it's about God, not us. That raises the bar so much higher. We need to be selfless and pursuing the holiness of our spouse. We need to have the gospel shape our different roles. But we are selfish sinners that want to use another person for ourselves. So how are we going to do this impossible role of fulfilling the marriage to the glory of God? You can't. And that's the point. The standard of marriage is high and holy, and God has told us he takes it very seriously. And you can't accomplish it on your own strength. And so this must make us a fully dependent people. And so I, I'm going to just point out two quick outflows of that, the two primary ways in which we show our dependence on Christ for marriage. First, it should make you a husband and a wife on your knees. Turn with me to Romans 15.
Romans 15. <clears throat> and this is not actually a marriage passage. It's a, mar- it's a passage written to the church, but I want to draw some principles from it. 15, 1 through 7. We who are strong have an obligation to bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let each of us please his neighbor for his good to build him up. For Christ did not please himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of those who reproached you fell on me. For whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of scriptures we might have hope. May the God of endurance and encouragement grant you to live in such harmony with one another in accord with Christ Jesus, that together you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. So again, he's he's addressing the Roman church at a church level, not marriage specific, but he pulls in many similar principles. He tells the strong to bear with the weak. He says, seek the good of the other. He tells us to be those rooted in scripture that they might have hope. And he essentially tells them to pursue unity. But notice what he does in verse 5 and 6. He breaks into prayerful benediction. He asks that God grant them the harmony in Christ that they would present a united front for God's glory. So he recognized they could not do this on their own strength, but he bent his knees before the throne and asked that God would grant unity for the glory of his name. And if this is needed on a church level, how much more when two sinners come in even closer contact being united in the lifelong covenant of marriage? It is essential that you in marriage must be regularly, continually praying for unity in your marriage. Husbands, can you say that you are faithfully regularly praying for unity in your marriage to the glory of God. Wives, I ask you the same. Can you say you are faithfully, regularly praying for unity in your marriage for the glory of God? And praying this not just because unity in marriage is so much better. It really is. But that's not why we're asking this. We're asking this that he said that God may be glorified. This is so much bigger than ourselves. I hope I've made that clear. And so we must be a people of dependent prayer. If this hasn't defined your marriage, let it start now because you cannot do this on your own strength. So the first way it should make us dependent is a people of prayer. But the second is that it should cause us to look dependently in the gospel and faith. And so again in that passage in Romans, Paul told us in verses 2 through 3 that we are to seek to please one another because Christ did not seek himself. And then in verse 7, in the, uh, after the prayer, he said that we are to welcome one another as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. And so he gives us these commands, and then he looked to Christ in the model of the gospel. And this, just like with Ephesians, where he pulls all of his different instructions for marriage, is pulling it from the gospel. And so thus to display the gospel, we don't need to simply just know it here, but it must be known here. The gospel is our model and the fulfillment or the power to fulfill these roles. And so we know this. We need to behold the gospel, behold its beauty, and be transformed from one degree of glory to the next. And as we behold it, we are then going to be enabled to reflect it in our marriages to the world. And so as we behold and we meditate on Christ's selfless, sacrificial leadership shown to us, and as this reaches down into the heart of the husband, it's going to be reflected in the leadership to his wife so that he can continue to love her even though she sins against him again and again and again. As we behold how the church, a people redeemed by the selfless love of Christ so that we are redeemed not to live for ourselves but to live for Christ who has loved and died for us. As that reaches into the heart of the wife that will shape the way she joyfully submits to her husband so that even if her husband mishandles his leadership again and again and again. She's empowered to do so. We can only do this. We can only fulfill our roles by beholding the power of the gospel and so display his love continually in our marriage. Therefore, beloved, behold it. Behold the gospel. Meditate on it regularly. So the verdict is in. It's impossible. You cannot have a God-glorifying marriage on your own strength. And so let your weakness drive you to the throne of grace so that you depend on him in prayer and you behold the gospel by faith and then praise him as he glorifies himself through your relationship.
And so Cross Life, may your marriages greatly reflect the glory of our God. May it reflect and display the gospel. May you be those men and women passionate about the holiness of your spouse. May you then first then be deeply ingrained, abiding in the word. May the gospel shape the way you fulfill your roles. And may you depend on your God that he might glorify himself through you. To him be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's pray. Great are you, God. And worthy is your name to be praised throughout the earth. God, you are so good that you would redeem us unto yourself. We could never deserve, never merit such a love. But you have saved us from ourselves. You've saved us from the sin that kills us. And you enable us to live life for you. And then on top of it, you give us the privilege to be able to display your glory in our lives and in our marriages. So I pray that you do this, that you empower us, and that's specifically the life and the marriages in cross life, that they reflect your, your gospel as a powerful witness to the Lord, to the world, so that many may come and praise your name all to your glory. I pray this in your son's name. Amen.